Hi, uh, this is uh, part three of Oh That Mo. Uh, and I am taping it off of my computer. It's off of uh, YouTube. I thought it was so good, I thought I'd make a series out of it called Oh That Mo. It's not called that in the original, but I'll put the link so you can click on it to see, to see the original since uh, you'll be able to see the Islamic sources, the the Quran, and the Hadith from where uh, the information is being put about Muhammad, where they got it. They're not just making this stuff up, but they actually got it from the Quran and Hadith. And if you're a Muslim, you're watching this, and you think, oh, that's not, they're just uh, twisting or taking out of context. Well, then put it in context and see where it's being twisted, okay? So anyway, this is now part three of Oh That Mo. Muhammad, but she had to go somewhere. Muhammad therefore we'll decided to instead here. have intimate relations with we'll go back a little bit. Moreover, Muhammad invented more convenient revelations along with the one we already mentioned involving him marrying his adopted son's wife. For example, at first Muhammad would give his wives equal attention on separate nights, but then afterwards he began to favor certain wives and Quran 3351 was then conveniently revealed to him, which says, Thou mayest defer the turn of any of them that thou pleasest, and thou mayest receive any thou pleasest. And there is no blame on thee if thou invite one of those turn thou hadst set aside." Unquote. Muhammad's wife Aisha, keen on what was taking place, then said the following in response, quote, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires. Unquote. Moreover, one night it was Hafsa's turn to be with Muhammad, but she had to go somewhere. Muhammad therefore decided to instead have intimate relations with one of his slave girls he was not married to in Hafsa's bed, namely Mary the Copt. Hafsa found out and she was very upset. In response, Muhammad claimed Quran 66.1 was revealed to him in order to justify his behavior. It says, quote, O Prophet, why do you ban for yourself that which Allah has made lawful to you, seeking to please your wives? Then Muhammad claimed Quran 66, 3-5 was revealed to him, which was a stern rebuke of Aisha and Hafsa for being upset with Muhammad for his actions with Mary the Copt. These are but a few of Muhammad's convenient revelations. How do they square up with Muhammad's other claim that the Quran is eternal and meant for all peoples and times, if much of it was meant to merely serve Muhammad's desires. Not only was Muhammad incredibly immoral, but so were his companions and his first successors of the Islamic State, that is, the Caliphs. If Jesus' disciples acted the way Muhammad's companions acted, Christians would never hear the end of it. The fact is, Muhammad's cousin and close companion, Ibn Abbas, who was praised by Muslims as one of Islam's greatest commentators of the Quran, was actually a very wicked man. When Caliph Ali appointed him as governor of Basra, Iraq, Ibn Abbas betrayed Ali and stole a large amount of money and provisions from the Muslim treasury for himself and left to go live in Mecca. Now, Muhammad's early followers also murdered each other in order to gain leadership over the Muslim people after Muhammad died. For example, after Muhammad's death, Uthman, the third caliph, was assassinated by Egyptian Muslims and Abu Bakr's son, who supported Ali as the rightful caliph. Tabari reports, Muhammad b. Abi Bakr, Abu Bakr's son, came with 13 Egyptian men and went up to Uthman. He seized his beard and shook it until I heard his teeth chattering. Muhammad b. Abi Bakr said, Muwiya was no help to you, nor was Ibn Amir, nor your letters. Uthman said, Let go of my beard, son of my brother. Let go of my beard. Then I saw Ibn Abi Bakr signaling with his eye to one of the rebels. He came over to him with a broad iron-headed arrow and stabbed him in the head with it. They gathered round him and killed him." Unquote. Then Ali became the fourth caliph. Now Muhammad's wife Aisha hated Ali for years because he accused her of being unfaithful to Muhammad, and thus she incited Muslims to fight against him. At the same time Talha and al-Zubair, companions of Muhammad, 
wanted Ali dead and did not recognize his succession as caliph. This resulted in the Battle of the Camel, where Aisha, Talha, Al-Zubair, and thousands of Muhammad's followers, family, and friends fought Caliph Ali and the Muslims under his leadership. Thousands of Muslims died in the battle, but Ali was eventually victorious. Talha and Zubair were killed, while Aisha was arrested. Next, a relative of Muhammad and writer of the Quran who was close to Uthman named Muwiyah accused Ali, the fourth caliph, of harboring the murderers of Uthman, the third caliph. This led to the Battle of Safain between Ali and Muwiyah, where many Muslims died fighting each other. Then later a Muslim assassinated Ali and Muwiyah proclaimed himself caliph. It is because of events like this that the Sunni vs Shiite split occurred, leading to mutual hatred and fighting between them, even to this day. The Shiites support Ali and side with him against Muhammad's other companions who fought him, while the Sunnis hate the Shiites for doing so. One of the biggest problems for Muslims is the spiritual reliability of Muhammad. Some of the descriptions of Muhammad receiving revelations sound like something straight out of the exorcist. Apart from that, there are a number of details in the Muslim sources that seriously call into question Muhammad's spiritual reliability. When Muhammad was young, his foster mother thought he was demon-possessed since two beings threw him to the ground and he was found with a livid face. Moreover, Muhammad's first alleged revelational experience with the being that would come to be viewed as Gabriel was actually demonic. In Sahih Bukhari, we read about this early encounter in the cave of Hira between Muhammad and this being, quote, The Prophet added, The angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it any more. Then he released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it any more. Then he released me again and asked me to read, but again I replied, I do not know how to read, or what shall I read? Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me, and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists, has created man from a clot, read, and your Lord is the most generous. Another early report says here Muhammad was being strangled so hard he felt like he was going to die. We know from Muslim records that when Muhammad began receiving revelations, his first impression was that he was demon-possessed. We know that after his experience in the cave, he became suicidal, tried to hurl himself off a cliff. We know that it was his wife Khadija, or cousin Wadika, who persuaded him that he wasn't possessed, he was a prophet of God. Now, what happened to Muhammad in the cave when the Quran started coming to him? I, I don't know. But I know this, when he ran out of that cave, uh, terrified, depressed, and suicidal, he was convinced that he had seen a demon, and that's a problem. Initially, Muhammad's wife's cousin Waraka correctly believed Muhammad was demon-possessed. After Muhammad's wife Khadija explained to Waraka what was happening with Muhammad after his first encounter with the being who would come to be seen as Gabriel, Waraka had a very interesting perspective, quote, Wadaka expressed surprise and said Jibreel only came to prophets, the best of creatures, so he wished to meet the prophet. He said that sometimes the devil deceives people pretending to be Jibreel, and then he to whom the devil goes turns mad." Unquote. This is correct, as 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Muhammad's revelations were clearly demonic possessions. During his alleged revelations, Muhammad would hear ringing in his ears and sweat profusely. He would turn red and breathe heavily. He would be choked. He would move his lips quickly. He would hear voices thinking trees and rocks were speaking to him. He would fall to his knees with trembling shoulders. He would feel dread and terror. He would have a racing heart with swollen veins on his shoulders and neck he would have a severe fever. This is consistent with demonic possession, and it's inconsistent with what is documented about the experiences of previous prophets who received actual revelations from God. And there are other problems. Think about the satanic verses, the verses that 
Muhammad delivered to his followers and later claimed were from Satan. Uh, when Muhammad, this is how the story goes, when Muhammad was preaching in Mecca, he, he didn't win very many converts, but he wanted his countrymen to accept Islam, and he was hoping to receive a revelation that would help them. And then one day, of course, he got... <clears throat> End of part three. Part four coming up now.